About an hour ago, a small jet went down inside New York City. The president was on board. President of what? That's not funny, Pliskin. Escape from New York is a 1981 action film directed by John Carpenter that would become a large box office success and would also become a cult classic. In the future of 1988, the crime rate in the United States of America soars 400%. The city of New York becomes a maximum security federal prison for the entire country. A 50-foot wall is built around the city from the New Jersey shoreline, across the Harlem River, and along the shorelines of Brooklyn. All bridges and waterways are mined, and a federal police force encamps themselves around the island. The prison has no guards, and the only rule is that once you go in, you don't come out. In the future modern day of 1997, Following several conflicts around the world during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, including battles in Europe, the President of the United States, John Harker, played by Donald Pleasance, is aboard his plane Air Force One. He is en route to a peace summit in Hartford, Connecticut. The plane is hijacked by a crazy woman, played by Nancy Stevens, who slits the throats of the pilots and heads towards New York City. In the name of the workers and all the oppressed of this imperialist country have struck a fatal blow to the racist police state. The president is evacuated via an escape pod with a tracking device on his wrist and a briefcase with very important information inside. The crazy terrorist deliberately crashes the plane in downtown Manhattan. Meanwhile, former Special Forces soldier and war hero Snake Plissken, played by Kurt Russell, is about to be imprisoned in Manhattan after being convicted of robbing the Federal Reserve. Police Commissioner Bob Houck, played by Lee Van Cleef, tries an unsuccessful rescue attempt to save the president, but discovers that the president is being held hostage by the crazies. They touch me, he dies. If you're not in the air in 30 seconds, he dies. If you come back in, he dies. Hauk decides to offer a deal to Snake Plissken. Find the president, bring him out in 24 hours, and you're a free man. 24 hours, huh? I'm making you an offer. Bullshit. Straight, just like I said. I'll think about it. No time. Give me an answer. Get a new president. We're still at war, Plissken. We need him alive. I don't give a fuck about your war. Or your president. Is that your answer? I'm thinking about it. After Snake agrees, Hauk ensures Snake's cooperation by having him injected with micro-explosives that will pop his carotid arteries in 22 hours if he doesn't get the president out of New York. We'll burn out the charges if you have the president. What if I'm a little late? No more Hartford Summit and no more Snake Plissken. After Snake is equipped with guns, ammo, and gadgets, he uses a stealth glider to land on top of the World Trade Center and then heads into Manhattan to try and follow the signal from the president's tracking device. I'm inside the World Trade Center on the 50th floor, just like Leningrad, Hauk. You'll have to use the east stairwell. It's going to take you a little while to get ground level. Call me when you get outside. After being attacked by crazies, his radio is destroyed. But he finds help from a man named Cabby, played by Ernest Borgnine. Snake Fliskin in my cab? <laughs> Wait till I tell Eddie. <laughs> yes, sir, I've been driving this cab for 30 years, this very same cab. I'm gonna ask you. Now, where's the president? Uh, the Duke got him. Everybody knows the Duke's got him. Cabby tells Snake that the president is being held by the Duke of New York, played by Isaac Hayes. Cabby takes Snake to a man named Brain, played by Harry Dean Stanton. Brain, whose real name is Harold Hellman, lives with his girlfriend Maggie, played by Adrian Barbeau, 
and is a former associate of snakes. Kansas City, four years ago, you ran out on me. You, me, and Fresno Bob. You know what they did to Bob? Hmm? You want to see him sprayed all over that map, baby? Where's the president? I swear to God, Snake, I don't know. Don't fuck with me. Brain has a small gasoline refinery that helps fuel the city's remaining cars, and he is an advisor to the Duke of New York. Brain tells Snake that the Duke plans to lead a mass escape across the 69th Street Bridge by using the President as a human shield. <laughs> the whole camp rolling right across the bridge and the President right out in front. Oh, that would have been so fine. <laughs> yeah, it would have been. Yeah, well, we're going with Snake now. Snake forces Brain and Maggie to help him find the Duke and get to the President before it is too late. Who are you? Talks at me, and we've got to move fast. Move fast? You got them right. I'll move fast. Be quiet. John Carpenter originally wrote this movie between 1974 and 1976 after the Watergate scandal. No studio wanted to make it because it was deemed as being too dark and too violent. That changed after John Carpenter directed the 1978 hit film Halloween. The film was shot in St. Louis, Missouri, Los Angeles, California. Atlanta, Georgia, and of course, New York. Barry Bernardi selected St. Louis to double for Manhattan due to the city's eager cooperation, its aesthetic similarities to a major East Coast city, and its proximity to the Chain of Rocks Bridge, which was conveniently closed and could double as New York City's famed Queensboro 59th Street Bridge. John Carpenter purchased the old Chain of Rocks Bridge in St. Louis for $1 from the government. He returned it to them for the same amount after filming was completed. Four separate locations in Los Angeles were used to recreate the World Trade Center, and John Carpenter managed to actually persuade federal officials to grant access to Liberty Island in New York to film. They were the first film company in history allowed to shoot on Liberty Island by the Statue of Liberty at night. The movie was shot from August to November of 1980. Studio executives pressured John Carpenter to cast a tough guy actor in the role of Snake Plissken. Their preferences included Chuck Norris, Nick Nolte, Tommy Lee Jones, and Charles Bronson. Kurt Russell was 29 years old and was best known for playing light-hearted Disney roles. However, John Carpenter had directed Russell in the 1979 ABC television film Elvis and they had a very positive relationship working together. Producer Deborah Hill agreed that Kurt Russell's youth, looks, athleticism, and freshness would add something new to the action genre and made him the ideal choice. The name Snake Plissken was taken from a real person. While writing the screenplay, John Carpenter struggled over coming up with a memorable name for the character. A friend of a friend suggested using a name of someone they knew in high school who he described as sort of a tough guy who bore a large snake tattoo on his abdomen. His last name was Pliskin, and they nicknamed him Snake. And that's how the name Snake Pliskin came to be. Donald Pleasance drew on his own wartime experiences as a prisoner of war for his performance as the imprisoned president. What did I teach you? You are Duke of New, New York. You're uh, a number one. I can't hear you. You are the Duke of New York. You're a number one. The character of Cabby was written with Ernest Borgnine in mind, and the character of Maggie was written with Adrian Barbeau in mind. Adrian Barbeau and director John Carpenter were married at the time this film was released. Kurt Russell and Season Hubley were also married at the same time this film was released. Season Hubley has a short scene where her character recognizes Snake Plissken, makes out with Snake Plissken, and then she's devoured by savage New York thugs. Lee Van Cleef flew in from Los Angeles for a one-night shoot and flew out the next day. When John Carpenter watched the dailies, he discovered that some of Van Cleef's close-ups were out of focus. John Carpenter was forced to use some of them since they couldn't afford to get the actor back. 
Lee Van Cleef had also suffered a knee injury prior to filming and wasn't fully recovered when it came time to film his scenes, which is why he spends the majority of the time sitting down. Lee Van Cleef stated that the tracking shot of Bob Houck and Snake Plissken walking down a hallway was the most difficult part of the shoot for him since his leg was hurting. Warren Oates was originally set to play Brain, but he took ill. He recommended Harry Dean Stanton for the part instead. Warren Oates would die in 1982 from a heart attack. The opening narration and the computer's voice in the first prison scene were provided by an uncredited Jamie Lee Curtis, who had starred in John Carpenter's 1978 hit film, Halloween. Attention, you are now entering the debarkation area. No talking, no smoking. Follow the orange line to the processing area. The next scheduled departure to the prison is in two hours. You now have the option to terminate and be cremated on the premises. If you elect this option, notify the duty sergeant in your processing area. The Secret Service agent attempting to break back into the cockpit of Air Force One to stop the hijacker is Stephen Ford, the son of United States President Gerald Ford. She's bolted the door. Can't you shoot off the lock? No, sir. She's pressurized the cabin. How about lifting the door off at the hinges? No, sir. Snake Plissken's primary weapon is a Mac-10 with a rifle scope mounted on a sound suppressor. He also uses a Smith & Wesson Model 67 with a scope. Kurt Russell also wore long hair and a patch over his left eye in the 1992 comedy film Captain Ron. He appears to be playing the Captain Ron character in that film as a comically drunk version of Snake Plissken. One night while they were shooting on location in St. Louis, Missouri, Kurt Russell, in his Snake Plissken attire, encountered some local thugs. The thugs were actually intimidated by his appearance and didn't give him any trouble. Kurt Russell has stated that this movie is his favorite of all of his films, and that Snake Plissken is his favorite character he's ever played. Nancy Stevens, who plays the plane hijacker, starred in Halloween and Halloween 2 as a nurse named Marion Chambers. Originally, John Carpenter wanted Snake to flick his cigarette at the president and hit him in the chest. Kurt Russell was not comfortable doing that. He and John Carpenter compromised by having Snake toss the cigarette in the president's general direction. The wireframe computer graphics on the display screens and the glider were not computer generated. The computers capable of those types of graphics were too expensive at the time. Special effects designers built a model of the city, painted it black, attached bright white tape to the model buildings in an orderly grid, and moved a camera through the model city. At the beginning of the movie, a terrorist hijacks Air Force One, kills the pilots, and crashes the plane into a skyscraper in New York near the World Trade Center towers. Twenty years after the release of this film, on September 11, 2001, the World Trade Center towers would be deliberately hit by hijacked airliners and would be destroyed. This film was released on July 10, 1981, the same day as the animated film The Fox and the Hound, which features Kurt Russell as the voice of Copper. On a budget of $6 million, Escape from New York grossed a total of $25.2 million, making it a substantial box office success. As the years pass since the release of this movie, it has always continued to take on a cult-like following. This movie spawned books, comic books, action figure toys, and even a 1981 board game. The first time I saw this movie was when I was about 11 or 12 years old. I loved it. While I'm not big on science fiction or futuristic movies, something like this movie was easy enough to wrap my mind around. New York City is a cesspool. They turned it into a federal prison. The president's plane crashes into the city and he is kidnapped. They send in a good patriotic American war hero with some crimes on his record to get the president out. The president will pardon him. Everything will be good. That's easy to follow. Fun to watch. Snake Plissken might be a badass who doesn't care about anything, but he still loves America, and he still understands the stakes. When Lee Van Cleef's character Bob Houck says to Snake Plissken that the tape has to reach the summit because it deals with nuclear fusion, you could hear Snake mumble, All right. 
He has a briefcase attached to his wrist. The tape recording inside has to reach Hartford in 22 hours. What's on it? Do you know anything about nuclear fusion? No. You can tell that despite his tough guy exterior, he still understands what has to be done for America. You see this at another point in the film where he addresses who he thinks is the president as Mr. President. Mr. President. I'm the president. Sure, I'm the president. I, I, I knew when I, I got this thing, I, I'd be president. As badass as he is, Snake Plissken is too much of a patriot to not properly address the President of the United States. Hulk. I'm right here, Plissken. You assholes are looking at it, but it's not the President. Hail to the chief. Da, 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 da. This movie is one of my favorite action films, and just like Assault on Precinct 13 and Halloween, it has that late 1970s, early 1980s John Carpenter synth music and that dark, gritty feel that I absolutely love. I absolutely love that 1981 pop culture. I absolutely love it. You gonna kill me now, Snake? I'm too tired. Maybe later. I highly recommend the 1981 science fiction action thriller, Escape from New York. <laughs> 